Welcome back to Heroes of the Faith, a show where we are inspired by the lives of the saints so that we can become saints ourselves. I'm your host, Deacon Isaac Longworth, and the saint I want to tell you about today is Saint Hedwig. Now, Saint Hedwig, I didn't know too much about her. I'd never even heard of her until I went to university because the parish at the university where I was was named after Saint Hedwig. And I went to the church for mass and I saw her statue and I saw this woman saint holding a giant church in her hands. And I remember thinking, why is she holding a church? What's going on? I would learn later that it's because she did so much to build up the church in Poland that that is why she's often pictured that way in art. But the parish itself was super Polish. They did a Polish rosary. They had Polish masses. They had Polish festivals. And I learned that Saint Hedwig was a very big saint for the Polish people. So if you're listening in and you have Polish background, maybe you'll find a special devotion for this saint. But for all of us, I think we can really appreciate the amazing saint that Saint Hedwig is and what she did in order to draw closer to the Lord in holiness. Hedwig was born in Trebnitz, Poland in 1174. Her father was a wealthy count. And so she and her seven siblings, they lacked nothing. Uh, They were actually raised in the family castle, which is pretty cool. Sometimes I wish I was raised in a castle, but that's how Hedwig was raised. And she had a very Catholic upbringing, especially from her mother. Her mother especially um, taught her the faith, showed her how to pray, showed her how to love God. And so as a little girl, she was very into prayer because of the example of her mother. And she was sent off to receive her education as she got a little bit older at a convent of nuns. But as was the practice in the time when she was an early teenager, she was called out of school in order to be married to a man named Henry, who was nine years older than her. Now, like I said, this seems very strange to us, but back then, In that time, this was considered fairly normal. Everyone, whether they were men or women, married much younger than they tend to do today. And as soon as you were old enough to have children, basically, you were considered old enough to get married. People just had to mature much quicker back then. And so Hedwig was married off as a teenager. It was a political move by her father. She didn't really know Henry. She didn't really love him. And her father had arranged this marriage in order to form a closer alliance with Germany. And uh, Henry, who was rich and powerful Duke, he had good connections with Germany. And so her dad thought, look, if I can marry my daughter to Henry, we'll have some good relationships with Germany in the future. Now, Hedwig, as you can maybe guess, she didn't really want to get married. It wasn't really something that she wanted. This marriage was arranged. She probably didn't even know who her husband was before their wedding. Maybe they had met once or twice if they had ever met at all. But Hedwig knew that her parents needed this alliance with Germany. And so, as an obedient daughter, she agreed, and she did the best she could with this new life that she had found herself in now as a married woman. Now, the couple, Henry and Hedwig, they had seven children together, and over the years, they actually grew to truly love each other. The marriage worked out. And Hedwig, just like her mother had taught her, she taught her seven children how to pray. She taught them how to develop a friendship with God, how to love the Lord. She would take them to mass with her. She brought them up in their Catholic faith. And she did a pretty good job doing so because her daughter Gertrude eventually grew up to become a nun and eventually uh, an abbess, which means she was the leader of a whole convent of nuns. And her other son, Henry, who was named after his father, he also became very holy, imitating his mother in prayer. And actually, the people nicknamed him Henry the Pious. That's what he's known in history as, Henry the Pious, because of how much he loved to pray. The people noticed how pious, how devoted to God he was. Now, Hedwig helped her husband manage the territory that he was in control over, that he was leading over. She helped to bring peace and prosperity to all the people that lived in that region. She saw the needs of the poor and the sick in that place. She provided food for them, clothing for them. She set up systems where they could receive a good education and medical care. Often, she did this all with her own funds. Hedwig lived a very simple life so that she could give away more of her own personal money to the poor and the sick. 
But St. Hedwig did more than just provide good infrastructure and good economic growth for her people. She did more than just protect them uh, from their enemies. Hedwig also had a real focus on the spiritual health of her people. She knew that they were more than just bodies that needed food and clothing, that they had souls that needed her care as well. And so Hedwig put her influence into action and she paid for new monasteries to be built in that place. She brought in new religious orders of priests and monks and nuns to come into that land so that the people there could have spiritual leaders. They could have places where they could go to draw closer to God. And so she did a lot to build up the Catholic faith of the people in that area. And her wisdom and courage became so well known, not just by the people that she served, but especially by her husband, that he began to trust her in everything he did. And she ruled side by side with him. They really became a devoted couple to each other. However, their life, even though they were uh, rich, even though they were powerful, it wasn't always easy and they faced many difficulties in their life together. Her husband's relatives, they were jealous of his power and they wanted to seize his territory, his title as Duke. They wanted to replace him. And once he was even attacked and seriously wounded in one of these arguments. And so Hedwig had to leave the family castle. She journeyed immediately to where he had been brought and she helped to nurse him back to health after his serious injury. He also had to face attacks from other Polish dukes. They were all trying to vie for more power in the kingdom, getting more land, more subjects. And so he was frequently attacked, not just politically, but sometimes he even had to dodge further assassination attempts on his life. It was not a peaceful life. There was a lot of danger lurking in the shadows. Once a rival duke captured him and held him as a prisoner, held him for ransom. And so Hedwig once again had to leave her castle. She went on a personal mission as the wife of her husband to go and get him back. And she went to the castle of the other duke and she demanded her husband back. And the duke said, no, I'm keeping him as a prisoner. But Hedwig was a, was a pretty stubborn lady. She wouldn't back down. And she was finally able to negotiate his safe return back home to his family. And so she was definitely a, a political powerhouse. She was very diplomatic, but she also was a very powerful prayer warrior. And I'm sure the Lord was moving in her behalf to make sure that her family was back home safely. But within her own home, aside from all the political drama and the turmoil, Hedwig as a mother went through a lot of sorrow and a lot of tragedy because three of her children died when they were very young. They never grew into adulthood, and so she had to mourn their losses. Later on, one of her sons died as a young man when he was on a hunting trip, and he fell off of his horse. And so this tragedy uh, was unexpected, and it definitely had a marked impact on Hedwig. And then even after that, her holy son, Henry the Pious, who I had talked about earlier, he also died tragically when Mongol armies invaded Poland, and they killed him in battle. And so poor Hedwig only had one daughter live longer than she did. The rest of her children all died before Hedwig did. And so through all this pain, through all this turmoil in her family and outside of her family, Hedwig had to remain strong in her faith. She had to keep connected to God. She couldn't let herself be distracted. She couldn't let herself be driven off mission because of all the tragedy that she was experiencing. And one of the things that really helped her stay focused on God, to stay rooted in prayer, was that she would take these breaks from the world. She would go on these long retreats to a Cistercian convent. This was a convent that she had helped found in the area. This was actually the exact same convent where her daughter Gertrude had gone to become a nun. And so the nuns there lived a life of intense poverty, of fasting, of prayer, of silence. And she went there in order to draw closer to God with the nuns who lived there. She knew that she didn't want the pressures of governing the kingdom, the losses in her family, to distract her from her primary focus in life, which was her relationship with God. 
And so she began to spend more and more time at the convent with these nuns, and she felt called by God. The more time she spent there in prayer, she felt called by God to imitate these nuns even more than she had been already. And so she added to her life of prayer. She began praying for longer and longer hours, drawing closer to God, speaking with him. She began fasting. Even while living the rich life at court in the family castle, she began to fast from rich food and to eat very simply. She began wearing the clothing that the nuns would wear, this simple gray robe instead of the rich clothing that duchesses normally wore. And she was so engrossed in God. She was so captivated by him that when she was at mass, she would be so overwhelmed by his presence in the Eucharist that the bread and the wine, when it is prayed over, becomes the body and blood of Jesus. She would be so overwhelmed by this that she would lay down on the ground before the altar. She would prostrate herself on the ground, symbolizing her lowliness before God and her desire to lay down everything in her life before him. And so she became holier and holier, but she felt called to go even further. She was asking the Lord, you know, like, how, how, how are you calling me to imitate these sisters even more? She knew that the nuns never married because they were consecrated to God, but Hedwig was telling the Lord, Lord, you know, I already have a husband. I can't become a nun. I, I can't divorce my husband. God wouldn't want me to do something wrong in order to achieve this good end of being closer to him. And so she believed that God was calling her to voluntarily hold herself back from the sexual aspect of her marriage with her husband. Now, this is a, a great idea from Hedwig, but she knew that she obviously needed her husband to be on board with this as well. She knew that it was a mutual decision. This wasn't just something she could decide on her own. She needed to see what her husband thought about this. And so after praying about it with God, she went and talked to Henry about this proposal. Now, amazingly, Henry actually also sensed that this really was from God, and he agreed to this idea. And so for the rest of their marriage, they lived as if they were a brother and a sister. They were still very much in love, but they sacrificed the physical aspect of their marriage as a way for Hedwig to more closely imitate the life of a nun. And in fact, Henry was so inspired by the holiness of his wife that he actually began cutting his hair and growing his beard in the style of monks at the time. It was almost like, okay, Hedwig, you want to dress like a nun? I'm going to start growing my beard like a monk. And so that actually earned him the nickname by his subjects, Henry the Bearded. And so with the permission of her husband, Hedwig continued to spend more and more time at the Cistercian convent, but she never officially became a nun mainly so that she didn't have to give up any of her money. The, the Cistercian sisters lived a life of poverty, but Hedwig didn't become a nun primarily because she didn't want to give up her money, not because she wanted it for herself, but she wanted to be able to keep taking care of the poor with it. And so the holiness of Hedwig had a great impact on her husband. I mentioned he was cutting his hair like the monks were, but he also began to imitate her life of prayer. He too began to fast from luxury, even in the midst of the rich life at court. He helped her in taking care of the poor and working hard to bring more religious groups, more monks and priests and nuns into that region to take care of the faith of his people. And so he was able to become very close with God as well. And when he eventually died, he died peacefully in a good relationship with the Lord. Now, of course, Hedwig was sad about the death of her husband. She was saddened by this man that she had grown to love, even though it had started as an arranged marriage. But she was very happy that in his life he had grown so close to the Lord, and she truly looked forward to the day when she would see her Henry again when she went to heaven. And so she lived out the final years of her life as a widow. She continued her life of prayer and service to the poor until eventually she too died at the age of 69. Now her people mourned this holy woman who had done so much for them, both physically for their bodies taking care of them and also spiritually in caring for their souls. And they buried her alongside her husband. 
Now, Hedwig is someone who definitely made a mark on the world around her because she was someone who used her influence, the influence that she had over people in order to lead them closer to God. So as a wife, she had a certain amount of influence over her husband, and she used that to give him such a good example that he was inspired to become more devout in his faith, to grow holier in his own life. She, as a mother, had influence over her children. And so she brought them up to be saints as well, especially with Gertrude and Henry, who really took on the faith of their mother. They really took on a love for the Lord. And each of them became holy in their own way, in their own calling. Gertrude was called to be a nun. Henry was called to be a warrior. But Hedwig knew that both of them were called to be saints, and she did her very best to use her influence to lead them closer to God. And when it came to her people, the Polish people, Hedwig used her political power and her money to bring Jesus to them by funding religious orders to come in, to teach them about the faith, to live amongst them, and to bring the whole region closer and closer to God. Now, just like Hedwig used her influence to do everything to point people to Jesus, we too are called to use our influence to show the world the love of God. And you might be hearing this and thinking, well, hold on a second. Hedwig was this rich, powerful duchess. I'm not powerful. I'm not rich. I don't have influence. How am I supposed to do that in the world like Hedwig did? Well, it's just not true that you don't have influence. It might be true that you don't have a lot of money. It might be true that you don't have a lot of political power, but it is not true that you don't have influence over people in your lives. All of us, all of us can impact the lives of people around us because all of us have relationships. All of us work in certain circles where we can reach people that no one else can. We can reach people through our example by living a life of holiness, and we can impact people by our words, by actually sharing our faith, our love for God with those around us. So for those of you who are listening in that live in a family, which is most of us, most of us come from a place where we know who our family is, you have uniquely close relationships that provide an amazing context to lead them into a relationship with Jesus. Whether that's your spouse, whether that's your children, your siblings, your parents, you can help bring them closer to God. My own mother is a great example of this. She did an amazing job leading my dad, who was not Catholic, to becoming Catholic, to a point of conversion. She did that through conversation, through praying for him, by patiently explaining some of his questions, by giving him books to read about it, by loving him where he was, but leading him closer to the fullness of the faith. I think of a friend of mine who, when he was a teenager, his parents got together with their siblings and they decided to put on a retreat for all of their own children. And the parish priest came to them and said, well, hold on a minute. Kids don't listen to their parents. There's no way that this retreat is going to be successful. But all the parents were insistent. No, we will not let the world take the faith away from our children. We're putting this retreat on. And so all the parents put on this evangelization retreat for my friend and all of his cousins. And many of them had powerful encounters with Jesus. My friend is a priest now because of the faith that his parents planted in his life, because they used their influence to lead him closer to the Lord. I think of one of the seminarians who I live with, who is right now leading a Bible study with his family, with his cousins, with his aunts, his uncles, and his siblings. He's doing that on his own initiative because he knows that his words have power with them. Because of their relationships, he has influence over them and he's going to use that to lead them closer to God. Now, you can also have an effect on people who you're not related to. People like friends or people you work with, coworkers, uh, people you're in leadership over. You can use those instances to share your faith with people within the normal everyday context that we find ourselves in. One of the priests in our community was an atheist. He came from an atheist family and it was at university with the friendship that he had with his roommate 
that he first heard about Jesus. His roommate was a normal, friendly guy. They were good friends. And he began sharing his faith with his atheistic roommate, eventually leading him to Christ, leading him into the Catholic Church. And now he's a priest because he used his influence to introduce him to the Lord. I think of another friend of mine who works at a factory. She's a supervisor at a factory, and she leads evangelization meetings during their lunch break at work. She's always inviting people to it. She never forces anyone to come, but she says, hey, at lunch, I'm going to be doing this retreat. I'm going to be doing this Bible study. Does anyone want to come? And she has led so many people into the faith because she's using her influence that she has at work. But Hedwig didn't just use her relationships as a way to influence the people around her. She also used her resources, right? She used her money, her finances to bring monasteries into Poland. And we also can use our resources, whether they be our resources of time, our talents that we have, or even like Hedwig, our treasures, our actual money to bring people closer to God. My aunt often volunteers her time to take Holy Communion to those who are sick and those who are elderly because they can't make it to Mass. They're trapped in long-term care. And there's many things my aunt could be doing with her time to do her own thing, to take care of whatever she wants to do. But she decides to donate her time to serve others, to bring them closer to Jesus. She's using her influence. My dad, when we were kids, would always bring us every single year, we still go every year, to go and sing at a soup kitchen at Christmas. We go and sing Christmas carols for those who are there. And my dad, he has a gift, a talent for playing the guitar, for leading people in music. And so he would take us there. We would sing songs about Jesus, sing songs about Christmas for all the people there in order to make that day more joyful for them. Or once I was on the road with other seminarians, we were heading out to go and do a praise and worship tour through the United States. And people at every place that we went to would give us money because they knew that we needed gas money to get to our next parish. We left our home with nothing, no money. We decided to rely completely on the Lord. And people at every single parish we stopped at donated their money, their treasure, so that the next parish could receive the message that we were bringing. And their gift made an impact. Hundreds of people came into a close encounter with the Lord through the worship. Many of them were physically healed from things that they were having problems with. And it was all made possible because of the financial gift of others. And so we can use our resources, just like St. Hedwig did, to influence people. All of us have particular gifts. We have our own unique personalities, our own circles of friends, our own family contexts and spheres of influence that we can use to impact people around us. We can do that either positively by bringing them closer to God or negatively by leading them away. And so let's imitate Hedwig who used her influence to do what she could to bring people to Jesus because it works. We can't all do the same thing. You know, I can't lead my children to God because I don't have children and I never will. As a priest one day, I will never have children. So I can't lead my family to God in the same way that parents can, for instance. But I can preach at mass, whereas they can't. And so all of us aren't called to imitate each other, but we're called to do what God himself has uniquely designed us to do. I'm sure there were times in Hedwig's life where she thought, I wish I was a nun. You know, I wish I could just leave the world behind and go and live and pray in a convent. But that's not what God had called her to do. God had called her to minister to her family, to minister to the people that she was a duchess for, and to use her resources to bring them closer to God. So I don't want to hear any more, I'm not a priest, or I'm not a parent, or I'm not a nun, or I'm not married yet, I'm too old, or I'm too young. You are exactly in the right place right now to be able to reach out to specific people, to impact them in such a way that they are inspired to draw closer to God. So let's imitate St. Hedwig in this and let's ask for her prayers now as we pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. St. Hedwig, you had a real love for the poor. 
You refused to turn a blind eye to their suffering. Help us to imitate you in giving generously of our time and our talent and our treasure to help those who are in need around us. You yourself suffered many losses in your life, the loss of your husband, the loss of six in your children through, through various tragedies, but you never lost your faith in God. Help all those who are listening in right now who have lost loved ones because you understand their pain. Help them to stay close to Jesus through their mourning, to trust in the mercy of God for those that they have lost and who they hope to see again in heaven one day. St. Hedwig, you used your influence to build up the church in Poland. Help us to bring Jesus into our own circles of influence so that wherever we go and whoever we speak to, we can lead them closer to God. St. Hedwig, pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.